should get go red any second now. Yep, I see it. Is it up for you? It's red. Yeah. It's red. Oh, weird. Oh, now it, now it's red on my end. Okay, cool. So, well, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, thank you for joining us today um, through our Fresh Perspectives program here at Launch SA. Uh, the idea of this program is fairly straightforward. We host it once a week uh, with a different mentor, different mind, showcasing some different perspective for the community at large to really kind of digest and gather. Um, Initially, this was sort of instituted by the fact that we can't really meet in person. Mm -hmm. um, so we're trying to extend the opportunity for people to get some learned lessons from locals, um, you know, in, in different mediums. And so I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Uh, I know that you have a pretty good career in marketing over 20 years, I think, at this point, right? Yeah. I I stopped counting after, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, close to that, yeah. So, so pretty good amount of time in marketing. Uh, you're pursuing your DBA in marketing as well, um, which is pretty exciting. I mean, that's uh, that's definitely you know to to keep going down that path of education, but then also the application of that education. I think is super yeah. exciting. Well, I think and for the, the audience, the, the, it's it's the. I guess to understand the terminology, because not a lot of people have heard about a DBA. And so just, mm -hmm. a, I guess, a quick side note. Um, so typically when somebody goes for a doctoral degree, they, they typically hear the PhD, doctorate in philosophy. Um, those are, uh, you can get a doctorate philosophy in anything from religious studies to, you know, um, I guess even business practicum or something. But the thing is about a PhD is a lot of it's based in theory. A lot of it's based on the concepts of theoretical concepts that you that you develop. The the opportunity that I found with a DBA or a doctoral in business administration is the next level up from an MBA, but it's creating um, practical application out of a uh, you know dissertation topic that you develop. So it's really practical versus theoretical. So just wanted to throw that in there. No, I appreciate. It. Yeah, definitely the explanation I think is important for folks to understand. So, um, you know, and, and again, having that ability to talk through the actual input and output and application, I think is super important in context. And then um, I know that you, and I'm not going to spoil your entire background. Oh, no, no <laughs> I know that you uh, have your own consulting company, mm -hmm. uh, left brain plus right Correct. brain. Is that right? Yes. Is, okay, great. And then, um, you're also a consultant for Adobe, is that right? I am, yes. Perfect. Um, so yeah, I guess I mean I kind of gave the like the places or sure. you know, the, maybe the things, but you know, can maybe you give us a little bit more context about who you are? Yeah. You know, kind of, you know, what's your background and why you even why you're even here in terms of marketing and, and doing this stuff today? Absolutely. Yeah. So I guess let me start off by saying before I really got into the co corporate world and everything. I started off as a small business entrepreneur trying to figure out, trying to, you know, be my own boss and do a lot of my own things, right? I've done everything from, you know, an online Mexican pottery business to uh, owning bars and restaurants to doing concert promotions um, to just doing random jobs here and there, trying to figure out businesses at work. And I've made money and I've lost a ton of money. And I've had successes and I've crashed and burned. I've done all those things. And really where my career started to take off was after I got my MBA, um, I uh, had the, the amazing opportunity to get my MBA at Tulane University in New Orleans. But the funny thing is I moved down there in July of 2005. And for anybody listening, you're sitting there thinking, okay, July 2005, I think something happened in New Orleans. Well, yeah, Katrina hit. So I was a Katrina evacuee. I was the guy who went down there two months before school started to get my master's and then all of a sudden Katrina hit and we had to evacuate the city. So I left, um, I had the opportunity to go to, sorry about that. My dogs are here, but this is right. Real life COVID times, right? Um, so yeah. I had the opportunity to go to Boston university for, um, for a semester. And after going to Boston university, coming back, I came back to new Orleans and new Orleans was still a mess. And what the school decided to do was turn us into consultants. They said, we got all these really smart MBA students. 
We want to put them to the test. We're going to make it part of the class. And it was part of the, um, the Freeman Consulting Group. So we went out and we helped local businesses. They, they actually gave us a grade for how we helped them. So I got that bug um, into marketing, that bug into consulting. And after that, I started my corporate career. So I started off at Rackspace locally in San Antonio. I was there for about six years and I had some big shoes to fill um, with some big opportunities because they were growing minimum 25% year over year. And they, they saw something in me and they saw the, the drive that I had and the passion I had, and I was in charge of um, buying all their media, doing all their email marketing, database marketing, analytics, um, basically helping to run their demand gen team. And uh, with that, I was managing a budget of about $15 million a year, and it was pretty big. And I had a great team, and I had a great manager, um, you know, uh, great guy, help, you know, just really mentor me and drive me and, and, and really help me fail and help me learn. And so his name is Kirk Wright, great guy. Um, and I got to meet some uh, lifelong friends along the path. But in that with Rackspace, I think Rackspace was that starting point. So, you know, if you ever ask that question, what does it take to jump from a junior level marketer into a seasoned marketer is you've got to crash and burn. You got to fail, but you got to have a good, strong mentor and somebody to help explain things to you. I remember I had a VP named Klee Kleber. Um, kind of cool, funny name, right? With the, it's got this, right? It's, you know, yeah. the Klee Kleber, right? It's like a superhero name. Um, he used to tell me, he said, every time that there's something that you need to fix, he didn't say wrong, but every time there's something you need to fix, I'm going to tell you how to do it better, but I'm going to explain to you what you did and how you can do it better. And, he, and then he's going to explain why. And he did this for me every single time. He did this for me for almost six years. And it was probably the most rewarding thing that I've ever had because I knew what I had, what to fix. And I iterated myself and I uh, changed and adapted myself. And I think outside of that growth from Rackspace, that's where I really learned um, to really drive and, and to want to do more with my career. And I moved over to Harlan Clark Financial Services. I got to run um, their digital marketing uh, uh, business with about 13 different e-commerce brands. And I got the opportunity after that to go to IBM. And at IBM, I had the fortune to do product marketing and lead a team um, where we were uh, managing their analytics products. Then they trained me to be a speaker. I, I got to go um, across the U.S. and be a public speaker for IBM um, at their conferences. And they taught me you know, how to really tell stories. And they taught me how to just really take a very complex issue like data fragmentation and, and create a 45 minute speech on it to hundreds of people in an audience. Um, after that, I was able to go over to Axiom, the data company. I learned a lot of great things and I kept on pivoting. But where I ended up today is I'm a solutions consultant for Adobe. So my job is I get to work with companies you know, um, like locally, like a, a Whataburger or an HEB, all the way up to the Exxon's and Northwestern Mutuals of the world. And I get to um, basically help them with what's called digital transformation. And so the concept of digital transformation is actually um, my dissertation topic. And so I'm working on this concept called the six pillars to digital transformation. And so with that, I help these companies through Adobe's uh, services you know, find ways to, to create digital transformation. Um, outside of that, I also have my own consulting business as you're talking about left brain plus right brain. We're actually in the process of moving 100% towards uh, education and uh, training. And this is something we've been passionate about. So I, I believe in education. I believe in continuous learning. But I also believe that, that it's more of a, it, it's not a one to many. It's like a one to one to one to few, you mm -hmm. know. In order to really help somebody out, you got to be able to speak to them in their words, using their stories and their background. You can't use a generic story to help somebody out. You got to be able to speak to them specifically. Yeah, um, so, I think that's yeah. that's like that's um, something that I think is really true. Just finding those relatable components um, to to speak, you know, sort of the same language as you were saying. Um, to the you know to the client or to you know the internal call it you know, department or something like that. Uh, and then I think that's really interesting that you were able to go around speaking and, you know, really had the education to uh, traverse, you know, maybe call it more technical topics with 
uh, ease or, you know, at least the ability to be relatable. I mean, that's that's not something that everybody is capable of doing. So. It's a lot harder than you think. And yeah. you get on stage and the first few times that you fail, you really know what you need to change. It's so the last thing you ever want to do is be on a stage with uh, people in the audience and they look like they're ready to leave and they start checking their phone after about five, 10 minutes of you start starting to talk. That's never a good feeling. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I bet it's it's probably got, especially if you're standing up, right? Like uh, the few times that yeah. I've been able to, I've been lucky enough that it's either behind a podium or, you know, mm -hmm. behind a table sitting in a chair and that's, you know, you have your little crutch there, but, you know, you're, for example, I, I know that you have a, you spoke at, what was it, uh, Digital Summit, is that right? I've, I've spoken at a few Digital Summits. I've spoken at Dreamforce, <laughs> um, MarTech conferences, a few other ones, yeah. All of that sounds sounds scary. Um, yeah. <laughs> it but, is. It is. Yeah. And here's here's the scariest part. Another, but it's like the scariest part is the hardest sessions that they gave me because they knew I was. Uh, I, I guess I was. Um, how do I put it? Like a eccentric speaker on stage, to where I looked like I yeah. drank too much coffee when I went up there. <laughs> um, not not a motivational speaker, but um, they gave me the lunch sessions. So basically my mm -hmm. topics for two years in a row at this giant conference was uh, the MarTech conference in San Francisco was the lunch session where people were eating lunch and I had to speak on concepts of data fragmentation and open garden ecosystems in front of a lunch crowd. And wow. you know what the trick was? It's like if you ever saw somebody like just not paying it or 350 people not paying attention, you interrupt the crowd and, and you say something like, wait, wait, are they just serving dessert? Is that chocolate cake? And everybody, and you hear some people like, yeah, it's like, can you please save me some? And so it was like, I got some for you right here. And so then you, you bring the crowd back in. <laughs> it was pretty funny. Oh. Yeah. Food Weird is, little uh, thing. Yeah. Yeah. Food is sort of playing with food there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you, you talk about, you know, this idea of moving towards education and continuous learning. Sure. And then, you know, you're pursuing your DBA and marketing. Um, I guess, you know, can you give me a little bit more like in insight on, you know, what your, why your passion is either, well, really, I guess it's both. It's, ed, it's learning. And then it's also teaching sure. if you want to switch over to education, you know, how, how did that, how did that manifest? So the thing is, is that I, I know that, you know, being in the corporate world, doing marketing since I was about 18 years old, I'm in my, my forties now. Right. But um, I guess I've been doing marketing for over 20 years I, it's evolving. It's a crazy evolving landscape that even when you try to go back and look at original concepts, those original concepts are no longer valid. And um, no matter what job I had, what, what company I was at, the needs and the way I approached a situation through marketing constantly adapted. And I had to change the way I was doing. And I was sitting there thinking, education is is huge it, it's it's one of those things where you cannot work within a bubble and only have the institution of the people around you to be able to learn everything you're doing you have to be able to take input but then again it's not just listening to these really crazy awesome guys like the Gary V's of the world or reading Neil Patel's blog you got to go out there and you got to practice but you got to have somebody who's going to mentor you hold your hand through this. And this is also why I've done work with the Digital Creative Institute or DCI, um, mm -hmm. you know, with Brad Voller, fantastic guy. And I've been a mentor with them for now about five years. You got to be able to relate to the people, like I said, in their own terms, in their own way. And, and even as a teacher, so I, I did a stint at Texas A&M San Antonio where I was a, an adjunct professor of marketing there and I taught a digital marketing class. And one of the unique things about my classes, I remember going to the dean and the dean, she was asking me about, you know, my textbook, what did I want to use? And I made a case. I said, there is no textbook out there that's relevant. I said, I opened up a book and I said, look at these concepts, the four P's. I've never used the four P's in my entire 20 year career, ever, ever. And this book starts off with the four P's. Right. And, and, and if I'm sitting there and I'm listening to somebody on stage and they bring up the four P's, I'm just going to get up and leave because it's a waste of my time. You know? Right. And yeah. so I convinced them that I was the book <laughs> and it was a cool concept. I, I created a course curriculum and they said, well, how are they going to learn? They're not going to read anything. I said, no, it's a lecture class. So I had two hour and 45 minute classes 
it was a, I think a Tuesday night class or Thursday night class or whatever it was. And I lectured, but it was storytelling and it was relating to them um, based on, you know, different things. Like for example, if you're a millennial, right. And, and you're sitting there and you're trying to uh, have some professor teach you how to do marketing stuff. You got to relate to them in a concept that they understand. So here's, here's a funny example. I was talking about bounce rates on a web page. Most people think, yeah, I understand what a bounce rate is. Some people didn't. So I said, imagine this, you and your friends want to go out to a club and you, you know, just like you're visiting a website, right? You go to there for the first time, you go walk into the club for the first time, you open the door, you look in and you look around and you're like, eh, I don't know, it's, this is, uh, this kind of sucks. Let's bounce. I said, that's like a bounce rate. And they're like, I get it. It's like such a big deal. And then I was talking about uh, marketing or nurturing, nurturing your customers. And they're like, well, what do you mean nurturing your customers? What, what do you have to do? And I said, oh, here's an example. You, let's say you want to date a girl. And I, for some reason, I can relate every aspect of marketing to dating, which is really dumb. <laughs> it works and it relates to college students, right? So I said, imagine you want to date a girl. Right. You want to date that girl, you text her, you call her, you send her pictures, you I guess follow her on Instagram, you do all these things. In the same way in marketing, you go after that customer. You try to appeal to them, you take them down the funnel, and you get them to, to really like you. And after they buy, let's say you finally take that girl on that first date. After you have that first date, are you going to ghost her? Are you going to stop talking to her? I'm like, no, because I want, her to, uh, I want her to go on a date with me again. I want her to keep talking to me. I said, it's the same way with marketing. You got to keep nurturing the conversation. You got to keep nurturing. And then they're like, oh, I get it. Okay, I understand it. Marketing, I, I get it. And that's the thing about education is that you can't take old school methodologies and ways to explain stuff. You got to use your crowd and be able to take very complex problems and make them relatable to your audience. And that's why I'm such a big proponent of education. I mean, as a hiring manager for some of these companies that I've worked at, it's extremely frustrating to be trying to hire people who when they walk in, you ask them about what they learned in college and these concepts and they talk about the four P's or they talk about random things. I'm like, no, no, no. Tell me real life stuff. Right. And so right. I, I think for me, I, based on guys like Brad, based on, you know, meeting you, Ryan, for, you know, for the years that I've uh, worked with Launch SA, and all the other people that I've, that I've had as mentors, it's one of those things to where I really value the insights and the opportunities those people gave me to one, either be able to learn from them or to be a conduit to help other people learn. Mm -hmm. And it's such a big thing. And if you don't do that, you're leaving everybody out in the cold to try to fend for themselves. And it's, right. not, it's not cool. You know, you can't do that. Well, and I, and I also think, you know, sort of in that test iterate function, you know, as the teacher, not, not hinging on a book to provide all the answers yeah. and, you know, putting yourself out there. I mean, you're, you, you leave yourself out to be challenged um, and, you know, for people to be skeptics and say, well, what, what if this, or, Hey, I don't, what, I don't think it would work in this situation. I, I don't know how much that's well, come up, but um, it does. Well, here's an example. I keep saying, do you want me to teach you? And I start off at the beginning of the semester, you know, when I go through the syllabus and stuff, I'm like, do you want me to teach you concepts that you have to memorize? And so let's do this. Let me give you two options. And obviously they never went with option one. <laughs> I think like, option one is how about we go through a glossary every day and we learn terms and I make you memorize stuff and you have to write down these things and all this stuff. Do you want to do that kind of class? Or would you rather me t give you a class to where I teach you how to think? Because when you get out of the real world on that first day in that first interview or the first day in the job, I'm not going to be there to hold your hand. I mean, obviously you can call me if you need some help, but I'm not going to be there to help you get the job and to do all these other things. Mm -hmm. You got to be able to think on your own right. and, be, and, and be creative. And so let me teach you how to think rather than let me teach you how to memorize stuff. Memorization is easy, but it does nothing for you. Yeah, that's uh that's, I mean, the, the dichotomy of book smart versus call it street smart. It, you know, I think that's so apparent. I remember I was an accounting student and, you know, I always kind of look back and I say, I think it, it might've been a little wasteful that we never learned, you know, things like QuickBooks. I mean, you could, that's yeah. applicable and useful and people use it and, and, yeah. you know, you're going to learn something, right? I mean, at least I learned some tax stuff, so that's not, 
that yeah. didn't uh, you know totally break me in terms of what yeah. abilities we had. But then I have this other where I always try to pick the adjunct professors, and I had this one that was you know he used to be the operations manager for Coke and Pepsi oh, wow. and yeah. Campbell's and you know, you'd hear how he would build the lines or how he would talk about that process management. And you're just like, wow, okay, I get it. Like it's, you can see the, you learned his approach. yeah, you learned his approach. You learned his way of thinking. You learned how he took a problem and problem solved it rather mm -hmm. than saying, Oh, Hey, let me go look in the textbook and see what the answer was. Come on. Right. You, you learn a thought. I think you learn a thought process and that's, yeah. I think maybe more about you. In my mind, I feel like the best way to learn is just to gather as many different thought processes and say which one seems like the most applicable here. Yeah, and run down that road. I don't know. Anyway, that's you, you got to be creative. I mean, you got to right. be able to think on your feet. And I'm not saying everybody's going to get to that point. And I'm not. And here's the other thing. And and I don't I don't want to derail you from the question, but when mentoring um, junior level marketers and a lot of people up and coming in the business world, the biggest question and concern that I get from them is you know, they're in their mid twenties or their late twenties and they don't feel accomplished. I'm like, Pete, what are you talking about? He's like, well, I don't own my own business yet. Or I don't have this new idea or I'm still not even a people manager. I'm still just like an associate or doing, I'm like, what's the problem here? Well, you know, I just, I just feel so, you know, I just feel so disheartened. I just feel so like kind of let down because I haven't been accomplished. I haven't done anything with my life mm -hmm. or that, that person like I, um, so I also um, do a podcast. So me and my good friend, Samir Khan, we do a podcast um, called the analytics today podcast. If you want to check it out, analytics podcast or sorry, analytics today, podcast.com throwing out a little, uh -uh, right? So um, we were talking, we were interviewing somebody the other day and she is now the vice president of partnerships and alliances for this very large company, right? And her first job was a sales associate at the buckle. And oh. you're sitting there thinking, how, how do you get from a sales associate at the buckle, right? A clothing store and now become the vice president of partnerships and alliances at a large tech company. And she says, you know what? I had the fortune of the, it's almost like a, a broken record here, right? I had the fortune of great mentors that taught me how to fail and taught me how to succeed. But the other thing is, she says, I took basic concepts of my everyday job and used those to learn. And then from that learning, I was able to then translate those concepts in what I'm doing today. Mm -hmm. She says, I learned product launches. I learned event management and I learned, you know, customer service and customer engagement and building partnerships is like, and I, I was joking with her, but I was like, how the hell did you learn that as a sales associate at the buckle? She says, hey, we had a new shirt line that came out. I had to figure out who my customer buyer persona was. I had to figure out how to sell it to them, what resonated with them, and then what tactics really worked. And I had to test things out. Some things worked and some things didn't. I was like, sounds like the concepts of marketing to me. Yeah. You know, those basic things in an everyday job, you use those to help build for the future. Exactly mm -hmm. what we're talking about, you know. Yeah. Well, I think there is something to, to be said about, you know, um, having that ability to justify what the front lines look like with the the broader picture. And so, you know, I'm kind of thinking like this is this may be a good time to, to bring in the mm -hmm. consulting factor of what you do, but then also your corporate background. Right. So you have all this expertise uh, in, in sort of corporate in terms of, you know, your learned um, career, if you will, and then applying sort of these big statements to smaller companies or, or are you taking, you know, some of the other businesses you, you're, you're, you know, having a hand in and applying them up. I, I mean, where, how do you, it seems like such a broad spectrum. How do you, where do you take pieces from either? It's, it's not easy. Um, I, a lot of it is so so my background is you know working with great companies and organizations like DCI and Launch SA helping out a single person with a great idea for a business they just don't know where to start or what to do and like i said talking with the Exxons of the world or the Edward Jones or some of those guys those are like I said some of my big clients um, the concepts all fall under the same umbrella it's just the scale Right. Mm -hmm. So for instance, um, I guess, let me relate it back to this. So when you look at my dissertation topic for my DBA, 
the dissertation that I'm effectively working on that hopefully by 20, I'm going to, this is kind of sad, but by 2024, by 2025, I'll finally have finished writing it because it's, <laughs> it's like 150 pages long. It's like, oh, wow. Yeah, scary. <laughs> um, and then I'll then publish a book and you can read the book. Um, but I'll, I actually, I'm going to publish the book after I get my degree. So it's got a little cool title on it. Nice. But the concept of it is the six pillars to digital transformation. And let me tell you about these six pillars quickly and then how that then relates back to how you can use that to help solve small business problems, entrepreneurial problems, and also corporate problems. Um, of those six pillars, it's the typical ones that people hear, people process technology. Everybody hears about that, right? The three that I've added to that are culture, data, and customers. So let me quickly say about each one. If you're a small business or an entrepreneur, people, right? You have to understand who are the right people you should hire. And then I'll also explain how that works with COVID and, and the change in digital times. So in the traditional world, you wanna hire good people, right? Do you wanna be a manager? Do you wanna be a member of a team? Do you want to you know, have staff or do you wanna bring in partners? What do you wanna do? There's no specific flavor that works for anybody, right? You gotta figure out what works best for you. I've learned that I've tried to build my own business before and be the boss and hire people and staff and they don't have the same level of motivation, right? They didn't have that why factor. If you go back and you look at the Simon Sinek start with why, you can even watch the eight minute, 18 minute TED talk. He talks about the, you know, the, the Wright brothers and they had that why, right? They had that why that drove them. So you got to figure out what your why is. And then from that, you can figure out how you should have people. Right? Should you hire? Should you try to do this yourself and then build out a staff? For the corporate world, it's all about having the right people who have the same passion as you and have the ability to learn. So process is the next one. When you look at it as, as an entrepreneur and you're talking about processes, the last thing I ever want to hear personally, and if somebody tells me this, I'm going to completely like shut down and say, you know what, this person's not willing to talk, is when they say the words, we've always done it this way. That's the last thing you want to ever hear in a business, right? Oh, do, how, how do you think we should do this? Oh, we've always done it this way. Don't worry about it. We'll just keep doing the same thing. Come on, right? You got to be innovative. You got to try and drive to do new things. As a small business or an entrepreneur, you got to think if everybody's doing the same, if I want to start my own business and I just want to replicate the same exact actions that somebody else has been doing over and over, you know, Am I going to be the same as them? Am I going to be a commodity just like everybody else? Or am I going to be a little bit different? Am I going to say we've always done it this way, so I'm just going to build the same business as everybody else? Or do I want to try to build something that's new and innovative? And the concepts of innovation derive from two things, chaos and diversity. So what do I mean by that? You have to introduce chaos into the business. That means challenging yourself, challenging your team, challenging the concepts, challenging your products, challenging your business, your customers, your reach, your region, your approach, your branding, challenge everything that you do and put chaos around it because if you don't challenge it, you're not gonna innovate. And the second part of that is diversity. You gotta bring people with, I'm not saying, you know, Hispanic versus African-American versus Caucasian, all that, no, I'm not talking about that. Diversity in education, diversity in background, diversity in the experience. If you introduce diversity and chaos into the room, you're going to create innovation. And that's how you create a new process. Technology. Whether you're a large company like, uh, you know, the Fortune 100 companies of the world, or you're a small business, you have to have tools to be able to help you do things. I mean, you got to have technologies, maybe free technologies like using HubSpot, right? or going out there and using Google Analytics for free to be able to run your business or saying, I don't know how to build a website, so I'm gonna to go to Wix, right? Something like that. So do you do something, you have to have the right technologies to be able to drive your business. If you don't use the right technology, how are you gonna move forward? You need that technology to be the enabler to help you do things that you can't do manually, right? I can't run this, I can't do sales, I can't answer all my social media, I can't do it all at the same time. Hey, streamline yourself with technology, right? So people process technology. Next one is data. Are you using effective data to be able to make decisions? As a small business owner, you got to look at who's your reach. How many people can you potentially reach, right? Uh, other things. How many people are hitting your website? 
versus how many people are engaging with you on social media. You got to be able to take the data around you to be able to make a decision. And in COVID times, that data changes. You can't look at traditional data like how many people are entering my location or my storefront because well, you can't have a storefront really effectively these days. What about your virtual storefront, your website, right? So people process technology data. Next one is culture. I remember um, uh, back in the day when I worked at Rackspace, uh, our CEO, Landon Napier, gave me the most profound statement that I've ever heard about culture. And he talked about that with hiring people at Rackspace. He said, Rackspace lives on the idea of fanatical support. But fanatical support is enabled by an amazing culture. But that culture is only enabled by hiring great people. So you have to hire great people to build a culture that can enable the way you do business. So with that, you have to have a culture that thrives, but it's got to be a tops down culture. You got to have something that centralizes down. And if anybody's listening uh, or wants to go and uh, look at something on YouTube, go type in on YouTube, um, Wolves Yellowstone Park. There's this concept called the trophic cascade, right? A trophic cascade is the concept to where you take a tops down initiative and fundamentally change everything about an environment and create permanent change. And you can see that in the example about how wolves then change the landscape of Yellowstone Park. Think about that in a business. You have to be the trophic cascade and come in and change the entire culture to be able to enable great fanatical support or great customer service. The last one is customers. So the six bullet is customers. Today or before COVID, right? You, gotta, you knew how to engage with your customers. You knew what customer experience was about. In today's COVID times, you got to figure out different ways to engage with your customers, right? How do you engage with them virtually? How do you create a new value to them when you can't physically make contact? How do you create a new value to them in their environment of being very busy, being at home, stuck with kids, trying to help homeschool, you know, or, you know, not getting a full paycheck like they used to. You got to understand the customer's needs. So I guess with that, that that's my extremely long-winded answer of the six pillars of digital transformation and how you can take those concepts to help both small businesses and startups and the corporate world. Is that super long-winded or what? Yeah. No, that's, uh, I mean, yeah, it's, there's a lot to unpack within it, but it's it definitely, <laughs> it'll be a book. Don't worry. It, it's, it's a, whole a book. book to explain well, let, let, let me, uh, let me poke at it for a couple, mm -hmm. couple things that you said. So, you know, I think you, you talk about introducing chaos and I, and I think that's, you know, this, this is like the, the ripest time of chaos that you could, I guess, ever, ever hope to introduce. <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe you don't hope for it ever, but, um, you know, how do you, I guess it, it, with such, it, it if you look at the times right now, it, this sounds like something that you would have to have time to maybe consider or plan for, like all six pillars. I mean, it, or is it something that you can adapt to? Is it is it person specific or company specific? I, I just feel like in in thinking about how people are adapting to now, you're going to see a lot of people fall, and you know, a lot of companies disappear and. Uh, just a lot that we're unable to adapt maybe because they were stuck in their ways or, or what have you. But, but I guess what, what do you think is crucial in the adaptation? Like what are the key parts of the company or the person that is capable of adapting or, you know, is that even something that you can learn or, or, sure. or gather or something? At the end of the day, when uh, I'm in front of a customer as a Adobe representative, we have this power slide that we use. Right. Um, and it actually, um, it talks about the concept of Adobe was uh, been practicing digital transformation for 35 years. They started off as an artistic creative company and then they brought in the concepts of data, right? Data and science. So they bring together art and science, right? Photoshop and then like Adobe Analytics, right? Putting those together. Um, it's the same concept of my consulting business. That's where, you know, even before working for Adobe, I derived the concept of left brain plus right brain logic versus art, you know, art, science, you know, um, data versus um, content, right? Creativity, being able to put those two together. And I guess the hard part with that, I, I guess, let me think. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough question. I mean, I it's, kind of put you on the spot there. <laughs> no, 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 no. Let me think. I, I guess... I guess more specifically, 
you know, I, I like on the spot questions. This is exciting. Um, I guess more specifically, what to what um, to what output do you want me to give the answer to? I guess. Yeah, I guess I'm. I'm just trying to figure out. You know, if if I'm listening to this and I feel like I'm in a crunch. Yeah. What do I? Where what do, do I double first? down on? Yeah. Okay. Where do I start first? You know, yeah, what what course. emotions do I it's lean on? Experience. I think really when it comes down to is what can you do to offer the right customer experience to somebody, mm -hmm. right? And that's, that's true with anybody I've ever worked with, whether it's a fortune 100 company or a small business, does somebody feel like they had a good experience and good experience doesn't mean, Oh, you need the five star treatment, like walking into a four seasons hotel, right? Or something to where they walk in and they know your name. Come on. You can't memorize everybody's name. Right. But, it's just one of those things to where, how can you transform your business to offer a great customer experience, but not put more of a burden on people as they're trying to consume your product or consume your service. And I think the second thing then is, it, I, I guess, is it profitable? Or if not, does it break even? I mean, a passion, I, I know so many people who create their own business because it's a passion of theirs but they continue to lose money every single month. There's going to be a breaking point to where it's like, dude, you just got to shut down. You know, I'm sorry about your pride and I'm sorry about all the things you've had to do to get your business. But at the end of the day, it's not profitable. You're basically paying other people to buy your service, right? You're paying right. them to, to, to stay open. And at the end of the day, you just got to realize, am I profitable or not? You got to change your expenses. I mean, I, I did see this article come out yesterday for I hate I feel bad for all the barbecue um, restaurants in San Antonio that are doing like COVID surcharges, you know, adding money for every pound of meat or something that you buy or quarter pound of meat that you buy or brisket or something like that. And the thing is, at the end of the day, what is the fine line of profitability and customer experience or customer service? Right. I think those are the two first things to start with. I mean... Can you offer something that appeals to somebody in the same manner that they had before, obviously with the new norm? And is it still just as, as a su uh, success? And second is, can you at least break even? I'm not saying you've got to be making you know, an extra $5,000 a month in your pocket, but you know, can you at least break even until things get back to normal? If you focus on those two things first, I think that's where you start. Okay. So, um, you know, it's not, it sounds a lot like really lead, kind of lead with customer and then analyze, you know, based on, I guess, call it the, the, the metrics of your process. If that, uh, that's sort of maybe yes. like a, a really cheap way of me. No. Explaining <laughs> yeah, it. Um, so, you know, but that's, I think, that's, I think something that, that always becomes really hard to evaluate. I mean, you, you probably have gotten this question before, you know, how much do I spend on marketing? Um, how do you, how do you actually, metricize? I got, I got that actually. Yeah. It's called, it's called cost per acquisition. I, I was actually asked this question recently. It's funny. So I'm just saying, how do you, how much do you spend on marketing? Okay. If you are a large corporate company, you don't even have to ask these questions because somebody else has already figured it out. So don't worry. Right. It can range between some people spend 5% of total revenue, 8% of total revenue. Some people do 20% of total revenue. If you're a small business or a startup, it's all based on this concept of cost per acquisition. So what does cost per acquisition mean? Acquisition is acquiring a new customer. That means somebody who bought something from you, right? So there's cost per lead and cost per acquisition. A lead is somebody who has an interest. Imagine... You go, I use the dating reference again, right? You, you go to a bar or a club or you go to a restaurant and you meet somebody. And that lead is you finally get their phone number and you start chatting with them. Yeah, it's a lead. It's not going anywhere yet. You're just chatting with them. It's just a conversation. You're getting to know each other. Uh, acquisition means you finally got a date, right? The cost for acquisition. What was the cost of everything you did to be able to get there? If you're a small business... And you're saying, I want to know what the average cost that it takes me to be able to get somebody to have an interest in my company. That's your cost per lead. What is the cost of somebody buying a product from you? Let's say they buy a service from you. And every single time they buy your service, let's, let's say they're charging 50 bucks. You're, or you're charging 50 bucks for your product or a service. Let's say they're a restaurant. They come in and they have a $50 meal, like two people. 
if it costs you $500 to advertise to that person and they only come in and spend $50 one time with you, your cost per acquisition is, 50, is $500, your revenue is $50, you are down $450. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what, and they never come back because you offered a terrible customer service right, mm-hmm. or customer experience. But if you can take that $50 and you do what 500 divided by 50, right, which is what, 10? So mm-hmm. if you can get somebody to come in 10 times to your restaurant, you broke even. That is good. That's the basic math that you do as a small business to figure out how much should I spend on marketing. If it costs me $500, maybe I should figure out a way to be more efficient and only spend $250 to get somebody to come in and eat at my restaurant. Mm-hmm. Then I only have to get them to come in five times before I break even. Right. Well, I mean, I think that's like an extremely articulate way of putting it, of putting it right? It's uh, the most simplified way to think about it. It's like, what's the cost to acquire? What's the cost that you're getting back? It's, right. it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a marketing concept called uh, customer lifetime value, mm-hmm. right? What is the lifetime value that they, of a customer? Right. And I guess if you're thinking through it, even, you know, kind of more based on tools or, you know, tools of the trade, if you will, you know, if you're kind of using the dating example again that you're supplying, you know, you may get a lot of leads if the you start, you know, your dates at McDonald's. Uh, you may get far less leads if you start your dates at, I don't know, like Bohannon's. Bohannon's or Ruth Chris, right? One of those. Right. Um, and then somewhere in the middle, I don't know, Chili's or whatever, but, um, you know, there, there may be a payoff. The people that, you know, the leads yes. you get from Bohannon's may, you know, be really you strong, but very expensive. You yeah. can have a mix. The thing is, you don't know what, what's called, it's called a hero customer. You don't know who your hero customer is until you test it out. Mm-hmm. What if it's, you're saying I need to go hundred percent McDonald's or hundred percent Bohannon's, or I do an 80, 20, 80% McDonald's. 20% Bohannon's. What if it's 50 50? You got to keep testing that out. That's what we do in the marketing world. People say, well, what is the exact percentage split of your customer split of your hero customers versus reaching new customers? I don't know. I mean, they, they're expecting me to give them a magical answer. If I had that magical answer, I would have written the book on that, on that concept <laughs> and I'd be living in Hawaii and we'd be doing this session while I'm sitting in my beach house in Hawaii because nobody nobody can come up with that right and and it's also that concept where I jokingly say to people where they say um well it's a best practice oh really okay who's it a best practice for oh it's a best practice for me okay well if it's a best practice for you and we have completely different backgrounds it's not a best practice for me dude Mm -hmm. right so it, it doesn't really work that way I can't tell you how to run your business it's uh as a consultant the hardest thing that, that you can do is try to help somebody out, but not telling them what to do. Imagine somebody comes in and says, hey, I've been doing this for 15 years and I've been struggling. How can I help? Uh, how can you help me? You know, what do you think of this? And my first uh, comment usually is, just so you know, I am a consultant. I haven't worked in your industry for 15 years. Um, I don't currently work for your business, so I don't understand the day to day. I don't understand all of your metrics. I don't understand all of your customers yet. I haven't learned anything yet. There's no way that I can give you an answer right now to tell you how to solve things because I don't know anything about your business. You know infinitely more about your business than I do. What I can do is give you a set of guidelines to follow. Remember, like I told you about as a professor, do you want me to give you things to memorize? you want me to give you things to learn so you can teach you how to think? Mm -hmm. That's what I do. Do you want me, okay, I can't tell you how to run your business, but I can tell you, give you guidelines on how you should be thinking about it to help you solve for that as an enabler. And they're usually very, I've never been turned down by saying that. So, Yeah, that makes a, makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. So, you know, thinking, I guess, to the environment that we're in right now, um, and also to the point of what you were saying with, uh, you know, you <laughs> The, the folks that, you know, may, may be practicing, call it a more traditional set of marketing or, you know, maybe, maybe just haven't updated uh, in a while, you know, what do you think, I mean, with, with so many stores out the window, uh, you know, what do you think was, was kind of dead, but, you know, was living on a thread 
in terms of, you know, marketing practice or, or what have you, uh, that COVID helped kind of push out. And then, you know, is there anything that you think that, that this whole scenario has just totally flipped the script on that, you know, we didn't really see coming as a, as a group. And I mean, whether that answer comes at a technical basis or, or just sort of a colloquial, you know, kind of, Oh, you know, this, this or that sort of way. I, I just love to know what you think is, is changing. That's probably the toughest question I've had in a long time. And I'm excited to get a really tough question like that. <laughs> That's a, ooh. okay. There's different approaches and we, you got to bring me back to it because I don't want to go off on a tangent here. Sure. Okay. So let me make sure I got it. So the question is what can somebody stop doing from a traditional marketing perspective based on COVID times to do something new? It's like start, stop, continue stuff. So um, not necessarily individualized, but um, more so along the lines of, you know, I really think that, you know, I'm just going to throw something out there that probably isn't necessarily broken. I, you know, mailers were dead years ago and this finally put a killer on mailers. Right. I mean, I think now that's probably false because I'm stuck at home and maybe I'm excited to go get the mail. But, um, <laughs> you know, that, you know, the, the urinal bathroom. Yep. You know, placard that says, hey, buy my thing after this or whatever. Yeah. That, maybe that's dead. I don't know. You know, it was a bad idea to begin with. And luckily, this scenario has killed it. That's kind of what I'm I'm wondering if you if you've seen anything that you're like, you know, I'm glad that's dead. You know, it fin finally COVID killed it. You know, Do you know, what's funny. I haven't seen anything that's really dead yet, but on pause. Everything's on pause. So, for instance, events, event marketing is completely paused. Right. Nobody's obviously going to a big conference right now. I, I put in some, you know, speaker request for big events. Obviously, I never got a call back because none of these events are happening in, in the entire 2020. Just like Adobe canceled all their big events, which is crazy. Um, event marketing is on pause. Uh, certain other types of marketing, I think, are still around. Nothing's really dead. I think it's just dormant for now because people still get mailers. People still enjoy them. People still love email. I, I think what it, what it is, it's the concepts of marketing mixed modeling or MMM. And what it is is where you go in and you keep changing your pie chart. And what that means is you typically have a pie chart of things of all these different channels that you're running. And in marketing mixed modeling, you're trying to look at all the, the, the structural way to have all these different channels run in tangent to be able to find the right mix and tune to be able to get somebody down that buyer's journey. And with that, I think that you just keep on evolving your percentages of putting 30% of efforts toward this and 10% of efforts toward this. There's no magic bullet. When it comes to things that have died, I actually don't see from everything that I've spoken to, from large corporations to small businesses I've spoken to, nobody's killed off anything. All channels of marketing are still extremely active and people are still consuming the same way. It's just their engagement that's different. That's the only thing that's, that's changed. I mean, when you look at a typical sales cycle um, from using IBM terminology, it's discover, early learn, late learn, try, buy, advocacy, right? Those are the different sales cycles. None of that's changed. Everybody's still consuming the exact same way. The mediums are slightly different. Let's say, for instance, um, one of my big clients is a... Uh, I can't say their name because I'm still working on the deal, but is a large high end refrigerator and stovetop company, which is awesome. You'll figure it out. But um, <laughs> uh, one of the things I'm talking to them about is how to do digital transformation. And he actually asked me this question the other day. She's like, he's like, what marketing channel should I avoid? Um, are these going to be dying out? I said, none of that's going to die out. You should continue to still do the same things. And he says, well, the hard part is we have a virtual showroom where people come in and look at our products and they buy, um, you know, through uh, a partner and they go in and they talk to somebody as an advisor consultant. I said, you got to virtualize everything. So I think the best answer I can give you is it's no channels are dying. Other channels are increasing, but people are still consuming the exact same way because people are stubborn in the way they buy. Everybody buys the exact same way, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say you want to buy a truck. You go to the same, let's say you want to buy the new F-150 Raptor. You go to the same Ford website to build the same truck 
10 times with the exact same features, the exact same color, and the price comes out exactly the same, but you still do it 10 times in a row because that's just the way humans are. <laughs> You're a strange person of repetition. People buy the same way. I mean, it's like the example of saying, I want to buy a new TV. So I can do a whole bunch of research and then I end up going to the Costco or Target or Best Buy to look at a TV and then I order it from Amazon, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. You, you know what I mean? People are creatures of habit and they don't change. Even COVID hasn't changed people, right? So I think the hard part is it, it's it's not the channels that are dying. It's channels that are kind of in dormancy, right? Or dormancy? I don't even mm -hmm. know what the word is. Dormance? I think you're something like that. Dormant, dormancy? I Sounds think like whoever's yeah. listening. Like laughing, it's like I don't think they even know. What <laughs> things are going dormant right now, right? Um, things are going dormant, but then you know they're going to resurge back. So you can't kill off anything. It's just it's the customer experience, it's the engagement. So what you got to do is measure the engagement with those channels and see what's working because everybody's different. It's like the example saying there's no one size fits all. Everybody's completely different. You just got to yeah. figure out the way to engage. No, I think that's, uh, I mean, that's, that's a crucial thought. I always try to treat every entrepreneur that, that I work with as, as the individual that they are, the unique circumstances they're seeing, they're facing, the background they have, whatever. I mean, it's, it's entrepreneurship isn't one size fits all based no. on all of that no. entirely. So you can't treat it. You can't treat the journey the exact same if you're trying to mature somebody to get there. But, but then on the flip side, you also, you also need to realize that, you know, there are there is some predictability in consumer habits. So exactly. You know, you, you may not be the yeah. same, but some of the customers may be pretty similar. Everybody buys the exact same way. They just right. don't realize it. If you think about it, everybody buys products the exact same way. It's like uh, they say what on average, you have to see a brand or get exposure to a brand eight to 13 times. Say you're driving down 410 and you're hungry and you see the water burger sign. You're like, Oh man, I missed it. And you start to see like a Chick-fil-A, and then you see, oh, I passed by Shake Shack. I haven't been there in a while. And then you go by this and then you're like, okay, I'm finally hungry. It's, it saw me enough to where I, I started to see that and now, yeah. you know. <laughs> for sure, for sure. So, yeah, and I think the, you know, one of the things that I, I've kind of been curious about, and I know we're getting closer to the, sure. to the end here, but, um, you know, in thinking about stuff that's really maybe transitioned upward, it, you know, if something's, are dormant, right? I mean, you're talking about how events are currently on pause. I'm really curious how, you know, what the end of that all looks like, you know, if people will switch to more digital stuff. I mean, it seems like digital has obviously gotten yes. uh, a hell of a leg up in yeah. this whole scenario. But one of the harder things I think uh, to solve for is visibility um, in that digital space. Like I'm, you know, I'm with, if I'm looking for local products, and, you know, those local products either didn't have web presence before or their presence just wasn't maybe articulated well enough for Google to pick it up, you know, in the first, I mean, most people aren't looking past page one, but yeah. I, you know, have done a few deep dives into page 15. And, uh, you know, if I can't, if I can't find you, what do I do? How do I become visible if, you know, I can't walk the store and see, oh, wow, I've never seen this brand before. What is that thing? You know, so the, so uh, I, I've helped a lot of clients with that and they, they put all their eggs in one basket. They say, well, if you can't get me to page one on Google search, then I don't want to be found or I, I can't work with you. You can't guarantee that I'm not going to hire you. I'm like, come on, dude. You know how many companies want to get to the first page? And right. The top three, you know, it, it just doesn't happen. So the thing is, I said, no matter what kind of keywords you want or no matter what you want to do, it's not that easy. So the other thing is you got to figure out other ways to engage. There's no one size fits all. So I think social media has become a huge proponent. Um, these communities, these groups, these uh, people bonding together to be able to share information. Like uh, I'm part of a Facebook group. I think there's like, what, 10,000 people in there now. It's a San Antonio curbside pickup to where everybody goes in there and shares Hey, just went to this new place. So good. You can still get puffy tacos, you know, curbside at this place on, you know, somewhere on the east side. I'm like, yeah, dude, I'll go there. Because every, every, who loves, who doesn't love puffy tacos, right? But, right. Um, it's one of those things to where I think you just have to find different avenues. People are, it's the non-traditional ways that people are engaging. So think of it as rather than people sharing information through text and phone, they're sharing it now on social media. They're sharing it their groups. So I think 
Google is still relevant, trying to get yourself on the first page to get your business out there. I think social media is a big one. Um, I think word of mouth is a big one. Just other ways that people are networking and building communities have been huge. Mm -hmm. and, and people are bonding together with that. So. Okay. Yeah, I feel like that's, uh, I mean, well, that's core to launch a say. I mean, we're heavily interested in the cultivation of community in order to help people see that, you know, some of these problems are not inherently unique and some of these problems um, can be solved uh, if you, you know, have that kind of basis of folks that you can lean on. Maybe you call the mentors, maybe they're friends, whatever they happen to be. They're, you know, people that all all combined experiences or Your shared circle. experiences, I think. Yeah. It, it helps influence how you, how you take it forward. So, no, I think that that makes a lot of sense. And I mean, it's, it's so funny how in each one of the conversations I have, it's like basically the same stuff, but different, different nuances. And so yeah. well, different, uh, different lens, different approach. Exactly. And I mean, that's the, that was the point of setting up, you know, a channel like this is to really, Oh, this is, yeah kind of see see and, and hear and, and get more of a of a perspective rather than you know a singular well i've lens, watched uh, your other episodes um and they're great i mean it's a completely different perspective of you know like i said diversity and chaos right brand yeah. diversity put a little chaos in the mix challenge people to the new norms and, and you get a greater output you get innovation right i dig it yeah. um well, I, I appreciate you taking the time. I, like I said, I know we're right up at the hour. So, um, you know, I don't know if you have any leaving thoughts. I definitely want to also ask, um, you know, if people want to get in contact with you, what do you, what's the best way to do that? Um, sure. if people have questions and follow up. So I guess the, um, there's a few different ways. Um, I have it there, not for vanity purposes whatsoever. I just have it there just because I don't want anybody else to own my domain name. But I have jeremyaroberts.com. Um, I didn't want this B-list actor who also – or so he's not a B-list. I think he's like a D-list actor. I think he was a red shirt in Star Trek one time. And he died. <laughs> we have the exact same name. And I took the domain name before he could, and I'm never going to give it to him. So sucks for him. But um, you can find me there. Or you can go – and uh, find me on LinkedIn, very easy to find. Also under Jeremy A. Roberts. Everything is Jeremy A. Roberts. So you can find me on my website. You can find me on LinkedIn. You can either go and type in um, lbplusrb.com, which is left brain plus right brain. I'm always available to be contacted and found and, and stuff like that. So it's very easy to find me. I dig it. Yep. Well, I appreciate you, man. I, I, I really, I thought this was extremely insi insightful you know, um, definitely some, some tangible lessons that people can take away, but then also some more curated insight from your own experience that I think would provide people some perspective and maybe help them translate, you know, their own life into something that means something. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, no, I super appreciate it. And, okay. uh, you know, hopefully we can have you back at some point in the future because there's just so much to unpack, Oh yeah. Uh, especially with that, that book that you're writing. So yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm ready. I'll, I'll wear like a, full body suit and just stand there in front of people <laughs> with full body suits. <laughs> right. Awesome. Well, cool. thank you so much, Jeremy. I appreciate it. Sure. Talk soon.